All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I call uh, uh, the meeting of the General Committee on Democracy, Human Rights, and Humanitarian Questions to order for this morning. Um, as uh, I have said during the previous sessions, uh, uh, the election of committee officers of the uh, Bureau of our committee for the 22nd annual session of the assembly will take place during this session, as you know. Uh, please uh, uh, switch off your telephone, especially if you are going to uh, take the floor because it will interfere with the equipment for uh, the interpretation. This uh, committee session will close at 11 o'clock, so we have uh, uh, about two hours uh, for uh, uh, finalizing the work of our committee. Uh, I propose that the draft agenda, which has been distributed for this morning meeting, be adopted. The agenda starts uh, with the consideration of the remaining amendments to the draft resolution prepared by our rapporteur, Mr. Joskun Chorus, uh, the OSCE a region of change, and then we will consider the remaining two supplementary items. And after that, we proceed with the election uh, of the committee officers for the next uh, session of the assembly. I therefore propose that the uh, proposed agenda for this morning meeting be adopted. Are there any objections? No? So the agenda is adopted. Also, if you want to speak uh, either on the amendments or on the uh, supplementary items, please uh, let uh, the secretary to know as soon as possible. So now we have to uh, finish the consideration of the remaining amendments to the draft resolution that we discussed yesterday. And uh, we start uh, uh, with amendment 27. Uh, I will maintain the same uh, time restriction we had yesterday, so we try to limit the, uh, the timing of the debate, but if necessary, we can have not one uh, in favor and one against the proposed amendment, but uh, uh, two in favor and two against. Then uh, uh, I will ask, uh, as we did yesterday, Mr. Choros, his opinion on uh, the amendment, and then we will put it uh, uh, to the vote. So I now call on Mr. Uh, Ms. Mazai, because Mr. Guminski is not here this morning, uh, from Belarus, to propose amendment number 30. Thank you, Mr. President. Before I present the amendment, I would like to express our sincere sympathy to the colleagues from the Russian Federation in связи с той трагедией, которая возникла в силу природной стихии на юге страны и повлекла многочисленные человеческие жертвы. Мы уверены, что российское государство и народ России справится с этой трагедией, и мы разделяем сегодня их печаль. Что касается поправки, мы предлагаем обратить внимание на проблему, которая, к сожалению, остается актуальной в регионе ОБСЕ, проблема проявления различных оттенков экстремизма. Об этом, в частности, говорится и в резолюции, которую предложили наши швейцарские коллеги. Поэтому, я думаю, будет оправданным настоятельно призвать государства-участники, все институты ОБСЕ активизировать свои усилия в борьбе с экстремистскими идеологиями, которые основаны на расовой, этнической, религиозной почве и их проявлениями в регионе на Thank you, Ms. Mazai, for uh, your remarks. Uh, also, I think on behalf of the committee, we can uh, uh, associate ourselves in ex expressing solidarity and sympathy to the, to the Russian people and to the Russian authorities for the humanitarian disaster that you mentioned that is making uh, the people of the country suffer. So thank you very much for raising that. On the amendment that has been presented, is anybody willing to uh, speak against uh, the amendment? If not, uh, we ask the rapporteur his opinion. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I don't think that we could find anybody in this space who is against combating 
violent extreme ideas based on racial, uh, ethnic, and religious grounds. So I fully support this amendment. So thank you very much. Uh, we put uh, uh, Amendment 27 to the vote. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Abstentions? Two abstentions, so the amendment is uh, approved. We move to uh, amendment number 28, and I call on Ms. Viola von Kramon from Germany to take the floor. Thank you. Ja, vielen Dank. Ähm, hier geht es darum, dass wir uns mit den Gremien, die vorwiegend und institutionell mit Menschenrechten ähm, äh, sich beschäftigen, dass wir uns mit diesen Gremien besser vernetzen. Und deswegen würde ich mir wünschen, dass wir einen Paragraphen einführen, um eine institutionelle Vernetzung mit den Vereinten Nationen, ähm, mit äh, den Ver äh, Menschenrechtsverteidigern, mit den Rechtsanwälten ähm, ähm, etablieren um hier auch über die parlamentarische Versammlung dort eine professionelle Arbeit zu gewährleisten. Thank you, uh, Ms. von Kramon. Uh, anybody wish to speak against uh, this amendment? If not, uh, we call on the rapporteur to give us his opinion. You have the floor. Mr. Chairman, I could be uh, brief. I fully support this amendment. Thank you. So we proceed with the vote on amendment number 28. Those in favor of the amendment, please raise your cards. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you. The amendment is adopted. We now move to amendment number 29, and I call on Ms. Mazai to present the Спасибо, господин председатель. Предлагая эту поправку, которая, суть которой удалить предлагаемый 21 пункт резолюции, мы не выступаем против полевых миссий ОБСЕ как таковых, но деятельность полевых миссий согласовывается в первую очередь с принимающими государствами, как по мандату миссии, так и по срокам деятельности миссии, и предлагая утвердить долгосрочные, не менее трех лет, мы тем самым лишаем государства-члены в их прав дискутировать и согласовывать эти полевые миссии. Поэтому предложенная формулировка нам представляется неприемлемой. Более того, она в такой форме означает прямое вмешательство во внутреннее дело государства, участника ОБСЕ. Спасибо. Thank you, Ms. Mazai. Um, anybody wish to speak against uh, this amendment? No, so we ask uh, the rapporteur his opinion. You have the floor. Mr. Chairman, um, this amendment is accept unacceptable to me. It is, I think, not an interference in domestic issues. Uh, field missions, uh, including monitoring, is one of the cornstones of the OEC. So I don't um, agree with this amendment. Thank you very much. So we put amendment number 29 to the vote. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Abstentions? One abstention. So amendment number 29 is rejected. We move to amendment number 30. And I call again on Ms. Mazai to speak on this issue. Спасибо. Уважаемые коллеги, господин председатель, мы с вами в комитете приняли неплохую резолюцию по деятельности БДИЧ в части наблюдения за выборами. И нам представляется логичным добавить в нашу общую резолюцию этот дополнительный пункт, который и призывает нас с вами к совместной работе по обеспечению прозрачных согласованных стандартов и методологических 
методологии наблюдения за выборами. Что э, логично будет продолжать документ «Базовые принципы организации наблюдения за общенациональными выборами по линии БДИПЧ», который мы имеем. А также вы помните все призывы председателя парламентской ассамблеи Совета Европы к нам подумать в этом направлении. Спасибо. Thank you. Uh, anybody wish to speak against uh, this amendment? No? So we ask the rapporteur his opinion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm trying to read it carefully, but what is, mm -hmm. uh, as it is stated like this, uh, I'm against. W what I would like to add, I can propose mm -hmm. that, but it's up to the up to you if you agree um, we should put something which is including the 99 uh, Copenhagen document that should be insisting uh, if you don't agree on that I have to reject this amendment uh, and I could do a proposal an oral proposal Mr. Chairman um, which could um, uh, like following building on the uh, existing uh, 99 Copenhagen document where relevant election-related commitments are already enshrined. I, I would add these words. If you could agree on that, then we could agree together, but otherwise I have to reject your amendment. So uh, there is a proposal from the rapporteur to the main sponsor of the amendment for this oral amendment. I imagine you heard what is the proposal, so if you can give mm -hmm. the Your opinion? Господин председатель и уважаемый докладчик, у нас есть хорошая резолютивная часть резолюции. Мы ее можем взять за основу. Мы ее с вами в комитете приняли вчера. Sorry, I couldn't uh, really get in on time the translation. Do, do you accept the oral amendment or not? Я согласна с тем, что можно подумать над формулировкой и даю адрес этой формулировки, резолютивная часть той резолюции, которую мы с вами уже приняли в комитете. Она может быть основой. Well, we, we, can, we cannot work uh, on hypotheses at this point. We have to take a decision because we have a, a written proposal a, a proposed oral amendment uh, which are clear and uh, unless uh, we are able to find uh, in uh, 30 seconds this <laughs> text uh, and present it to the committee we cannot uh, we cannot do it so if that is the case I guess you do not accept the uh, proposal by the rapporteur and we put to the vote the original amendment as it has been uh, uh, proposed so uh, we move to vote on amendment number 30 Those in favor, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Abstentions? None. So amendment number 30 is uh, uh, rejected. Uh, we now move to amendment number 31. And once again, I'm pleased to give the floor to Ms. Bazai. Нет, господин председатель, речь идет о какой правке сейчас? Двадцать второй пункт. Позиция белорусской стороны относительно непродления мандата офиса ОБСЕ в Минске уже неоднократно доводилась до сведения ОБСЕ всех государств-участников. Решение о закрытии офиса является окончательным, пересмотрено оно не будет. В настоящее время мы ведем консультации, и я вчера говорила, не исключаем возможности работы по проектам напрямую взаимодействие между Беларусью и исполнительными структурами ОБСЕ. Поэтому мы и предлагаем исключить этот пункт. Спасибо. Thank you. Anybody wish to speak against this amendment? Mr. Mantini from the Italian delegation. 
You have the floor. Grazie. L'emendamento è contrario agli indirizzi che in varie discussioni e dibattiti sono emersi. Noi vorremmo rafforzare la presenza OSCE in Bielorussia e crediamo che la delegazione OSCE della Bielorussia possa dare dei consigli, prendere anche degli impegni per indicare le forme e i modi di una cooperazione più forte e non limitarsi invece a cancellare il paragrafo che prevede la riapertura della sede. Vorremmo più proposte e meno no dalla delegazione bielorussa dell'OSCE. Siamo contrari. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else want to speak on this issue? No? So we ask the rapporteur his opinion. Um, Mr. Chairman, I am against this amendment. I fully agree with my uh, Italian colleague. Um, as we all know, these institutions play an important uh, uh, role, these missions. And I also uh, want to strongly urge our colleagues from Belarus to, to take each opportunity and each moment to, to look how we could find a solution for reopening, because it is really needed, it is really important. And as the amendment is saying to delete the whole paragraph, I assume you know that I am against that amendment. Thank you very much. So we put amendment number 31 to the vote. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Abstentions? Thank you. So uh, amendment number 31 is adopted. Uh, amendment number rejected. OK. I had to do it once a day, mistakes. <laughs> I'm in line with my <laughs> record. <laughs> so we move to amendment number 32. And I call on Ms. Valburga Asburg to take the floor on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this amendment talks about the closer cooper cooperation, especially parliamentary cooperation, between the OSCE and Central Asia, especially Kyrgyzstan. And I just want to say, for me, the election of Rosa Aknazarova as vice chair in the second committee, which happened yesterday evening, shows how very, very involved our Kyrgyz friends are. And I think that this is really something which can bear fruit in the future, and we should take much, much more notice of this cooperation. And this is why I hope that you are supporting this amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Salzburg. Uh, anybody wish to speak against uh, this amendment? No, so we call on the rapporteur to give us his opinion. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Wolburga is looking intensively to me and I can fully support <laughs> this amendment because I was there, we were there. We saw the, uh, the involvement, the good involvement of our Kyrgyz friends and I hope, and I hope strongly that this could be a good example for the other countries in the region. So fully supporting. Thank you very much. So we put amendment number 32 to the vote. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Abstentions? None. So amendment number 32 is adopted unanimously. We move to amendment number 33, and I call on Ms. Viola von Kramen to present to the committee. Ja, hier wünschen wir uns ähm, im Falle von groben Menschenrechtsverletzungen, wenn sie in unserem äh, Bereich der OSZE vorkommen, dass wir schnell eingreifen können. Und wir wünschen uns auch für den Fall des äh, Vetos eines betroffenen Landes, dass es trotzdem möglich ist, eine Untersuchung einzuleiten. Wir haben gesehen, wie wichtig das im Falle von Kirgistan war. Und wir haben auch gesehen, wie wichtig es war, dass Kimmo Kiljunen am Ende in dieses Land gereist ist und an einen Bericht hat vorlegen können. Und deswegen ähm, an der Stelle das Non-Konsensus-Prinzip auch 
für eine Untersuchung im Falle des äh, Vetos des betroffenen Landes. Thank you very much. Anybody wish uh, uh, to speak against uh, this amendment? No? So we call on the rapporteur to give us his opinion. Mr. Chairman, I fully support this amendment because our colleague from Germany already uh, gave us the, the arguments. It's good, and you also mentioned, uh, for example, the situation in Kyrgyzstan that was needed to be there to investigate. So I fully in, uh, support this amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So we put uh, amendment number 33 to the vote. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? None. Abstentions? None. So the amendment number 33 is adopted unanimously. Uh, now we have amendment number 34, and I call on Ms. Mazai to speak on this issue. Господин председатель, мы предлагаем 23-й пункт удалить, поскольку в соответствии с правилами процедуры в постоянном совете ОБСЕ могут рассматриваться различные актуальные вопросы. И в зависимости от предмета обсуждения заседания постоянного совета ОБСЕ по решению совета могут быть закрытыми для представителей средств массовой информации и неправительственных структур или открытыми. Поэтому нам диктовать постоянному совету, как использовать правила процедуры, я думаю, не следует. В ОБСЕ есть практика проведения двухнедельного ежегодного э, совещания ОБСЕ по человеческому измерению в Варшаве. Э, регулярно проходят заседания постоянного совета, комитета по человеческому измерению ОБСЕ в Вене. Какие-либо новые механизмы или дополнительные форматы в рамках человеческого измерения приведут, во-первых, к дальнейшему дисбалансу трех измерений, а во-вторых, здесь следует посмотреть и на бюджетные последствия. Поэтому мы предлагаем этот пункт в такой редакции не принимать. Спасибо. Thank you, Ms. Mazai. Anybody wish uh, to speak against this amendment? If not, we ask uh, the rapporteur his opinion. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I'm reading uh, uh, 23, I think it's an excellent paragraph. Also, the possibilities for the OCE Permanent Council to organize a special meeting. Uh, that is also strengthening the organization. I will stick to my text, and I'm against the amendment to delete the whole. Thank you very much. So we vote on amendment number 34. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you. So the amendment number 34 is rejected. Uh, we now move to amendment number 35. And I call on Ms. Fassler from Switzerland to speak on this issue. Herr Vorsitzender, geschätzte Damen und Herren, wir sind selbstverständlich auch für den Einbezug der Zivilgesellschaften in die Arbeiten der OSZT. Wir sehen aber einen anderen Weg dazu. Wir sind nicht der Ansicht, dass es noch mehr Meetings braucht. Ich möchte dabei nur erinnern, zum Beispiel an die drei Supplementary Human Dimension Meetings in Wien, das Human Dimension Seminar in Warschau oder das Human Dimension Implementation Meeting in Warschau. Wir sollten dafür sorgen, dass die Zivilgesellschaften bei den Meetings direkt einbezogen werden und nicht nur, dass man sie darüber informiert. Und der zweite Punkt ist, wir möchten eigentlich nicht, dass der ständige Rat der OSZD diese Aufgabe übernimmt, sondern wir selber. Wir sollten als Parlamentarierinnen und Parlamentarier bei unseren Regierungen anregen, dass eben Zivilgesellschaften eingeschlossen werden, einbezogen werden und nicht nur nachträglich informiert. In diesem Sinn möchte ich Sie bitten, meinen Antrag zu übernehmen. Thank you very much, Ms. Fassler. Anybody wish uh, to speak against uh, this amendment? 
No? So the rapporteur will give us his opinion. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have nothing against this amendment. Let that be clear. But it is, uh, let's say, in a more general way. And if I look to the original uh, paragraph, um, I think there it's more precisely presents concrete uh, suggestions for what we want from the Permanent Council. So I prefer my text that if you, the, uh, the, the committee here, um, is in favor of, I have no any uh, difficulties with that. So we have a complex opinion yeah. <laughs> from the rapporteur, and uh, well, if, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I prefer my text. All right, all right. So. But uh, we uh, remain but still friends if your amendment is taken perfect. over. That is more clear. So we can proceed to vote on amendment number uh, 35. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Those against? I think. Yeah. Abstentions? All right, so the amendment number 35 is rejected. We move uh, to amendment number 36. We have three more to finish uh, uh, the amendments on the draft resolution. And I call on Ms. Maria Lundqvist Broster from Sweden to speak on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the freedom of media is a human right, and therefore I uh, want to insert a new paragraph after paragraph 23 to strongly encourage the participating states to support the OCE representative on freedom of the media in efforts to strengthen and implement relevant OCE principles and commitments. And I hope that you will take my uh, amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Uh, anybody wish to speak against uh, this amendment? No? So we ask the rapporteur his opinion. Mr. Chairman, although it is a little bit repeating uh, that what was stated in an earlier amendment, I think still, uh, I believe it complements the tax, so uh, I'm in favor of this amendment. Thank you very much. So we move to vote on amendment number 36. Uh, those in favor, raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you. So amendment number 36 is adopted. And again, I call on Ms. Uh, uh, Lundqvist Broster to present amendment number 37. You have the floor, madam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to insert a new paragraph after paragraph 23. Um, uh, the recent changes in the Hungarian constitution have led to certain human rights issues. However, I have in my amendments to the resolution chosen to focus on the topic of media freedom. And I would therefore like to take this opportunity to urge Hungary to follow the OEC representative on freedom of the media's recommendations to change the composition of the Media Authority and the Media Council and make public service independent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody wish to speak against uh, amendment number 37? Hungary. Yes, Hungary. Uh, Mr. Naji, the head of the Hungarian delegation, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, uh, to be frankly, I have supported all the amendments uh, made by the Swedish colleague before, but I can do that uh, to do the same with this uh, very amendment, and I would like to bring three main arguments uh, why, I'm, why I am speaking and I am doing so. So, my first argument is uh, that um, I think this is not the aim of this resolution to name uh, specific countries. Uh, I was present at the discussion yesterday, and uh, Mr. Cheruz, and I would like to thank you for your resolution at this moment, told us uh, several times in concerning the Kazakhstan that uh, the aim of the resolution is not 
referring to specific uh, states. This resolution is uh, referring to all OSCE uh, members. My second argument is, and I am not really understand if you want to mention a specific state, why exactly Hungary concerning the media freedom. My second argument is that there is no need for urging Hungary, the Hungarian government, to listen to the recommendation of the representative of the media freedom of the OSCE, because there are ongoing negotiations with uh, Dunja Mijatovic and with the Secretary General of the European Council. Uh, and there was a scrutiny made by the European Commission also, and we have changed already the media law at three very important points. And my third argument is that, um, and this is the very topic of this amendment, I think that uh, the Hungarian media freedom uh, is not jeopardized by the government. The new media council, I mean the members, and they have five members, will be elected by the parliament and not nominated by the prime minister or the by the government. And uh, the supervisory body of the uh, public service media is a new phenomenon. This is a foundation, a public service foundation, and the members of the management body of these public uh, foundations are also elected by the parliament, and each parliamentary party, the oppositional parties, has the right to nominate for this uh, job. So I think this amendment is not appropriate and is not necessary. I cannot support it. And I would like to convince everybody sitting in this uh, room, I mean the majority, not to support this amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I now have uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Stefan Liebig from Germany. And then I have, I have other requests, but as I said, uh, if it is in favor of the amendment, maybe yes. If it's, uh, we have, if it's against, sorry, because we have already two in favor. Vielen Dank. Um, erstens zu dem Argument, dass wir einzelne Länder nicht erwähnen wollen, hatten wir gestern schon eine Diskussion. Nun ist es ja so, dass in Punkt 22 uh, Belarus und Georgien erwähnt werden und ich zum Zweiten das Argument auch schon bezogen auf Kasachstan falsch fand. Also ich finde es durchaus richtig, dass wir einzelne Länder in unserem Bericht erwähnen. Zum Zweiten das äh, immer wieder vorgetragene Argument der Nicht-Einmischung kann ich auch nicht teilen. Es ist unsere Aufgabe als Parlamentarier, auf äh, einzelne Tatbestände in einzelnen Ländern Bezug zu nehmen, die wir nicht für einen Einklang mit unseren Regeln halten. Also das Argument kann ich nicht gelten lassen. Und zum Dritten das Thema Ungarn hat, denke ich, viele von uns immer wieder befasst. Und wir haben im Deutschen Bundestag heftige Diskussionen auch zum Thema Ungarn gehabt, auch kontrovers unter den Parteien. Aber ich kann die hier vorgeschlagene Position nur unterstützen. Nach unseren Informationen ist es immer noch notwendig, darauf hinzuweisen. Nach unseren Gesprächen mit ungarischen Journalisten herrscht dafür die Notwendigkeit. Und ich würde mich sehr freuen, wenn wir diese Formulierung hier aufnehmen könnten. So I now have a request uh, from uh, our colleague uh, from Macedonia, but is it in favor or against the amendment? Because we had already two in favor and one against. Uh, just briefly, sir, uh, Hungary doesn't deserve this. The whole thing so is blown out of proportion right, yeah. and this amendment should not be voted. It's only one country out of 56. And as I said, the whole thing is, it was enough treated in the past year and uh, we should not vilify Hungary. The Hungarians don't deserve that. Thank you. All right. Uh, the, the sponsor of the amendment wanted to add something briefly. All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have to be remind, reminded about what the OCE countries have acknowledged in respect for human rights and the human uh, dimension, dimension. And the media situation in Hungary has recently changed for the better taking into account the international criticism, criticism. but uh, there is still more that be done to guarantee the independent of media in Hungary. And uh, the OC must continue to follow the program and the progress towards the media freedom in Hungary and have the courage and will to criticize. And uh, I really hope that uh, you will support my amendment. Thank you. All right. So we move now to vote on, uh, ah yes, then ask the rapporteur, which, which is important to hear in this case. You have the floor, sir. 
Mr. Chairman, um, we are sitting here in a political setting and we try to convince each other and listen to each other's uh, arguments. And I really listen to both sides. And um, I'm convinced by the arguments of our Hungarian colleague because he started with uh, the point that we didn't outline or we didn't or I did not target one country in my draft resolution. I did it not with Kazakhstan, nor I will do it with Hungary. Of course, it is without doubt that the role of the free media and the commitments which comes out of that is to all the 56 countries, not one. Uh, so I am uh, against this amendment. And there where it is stated by, I mean, I believe our German colleagues, uh, the place that uh, Georgia and Belarus are mentioned, it's not targeting, but that is a fact that in those two countries, the field missions are closed and that we're trying to open it. That's more the fact what is on the table. So it is not targeting or outlining. So if I see the whole picture, I am against this amendment, Mr. Chairman. All right, so we vote on amendment number 37, proposed by our Swedish colleague. Those in favor of the amendment, please raise your cards. Thank you very much. Thank you, those against? Thank you. Abstentions? Thank you very much. So amendment number 37 is uh, uh, rejected. We now move to the last uh, amendment, number 38. And again, I call on Ms. Maria Lundqvist Broster to present it to the committee. Ah, Viola, I have here different names, sorry. Ms. Viola from Cramon has the floor to speak on this issue. Ja, vielen Dank. Ähm, ich würde gerne ähm, eine, ähm, eine neue oder ein, 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 einen Vorstand ähm, mit hier einführen, wie wir das auch bei der östlichen Partnerschaft in der Europäischen Union etabliert haben. Und zwar haben wir für die östliche Partnerschaft drei Ebenen, mit denen wir mit den äh, entsprechenden Ländern zusammenarbeiten. Das ist einmal die Regierungsebene und das ist zweitens Euronest, also die parlamentarische Ebene. Und das dritte, und das ist das Wichtigste, ist die zivilgesellschaftliche Ebene. Und ich würde mich freuen, wenn wir es schaffen, auch hier im Rahmen der OSZE PV ein, zunächst einmal nicht ein gesamtes Forum, aber einen Vorstand zu etablieren, der besteht aus den maßgeblichen NGO-Vertretern dieser Länder. Und wenn wir es schaffen, diese Verbindung, diese Beziehung zu etablieren, hier mit der parlamentarischen Versammlung, um die Zusammenarbeit insbesondere mit den NGOs, die sich in den Ländern auch für die Weiterentwicklung der Demokratie einsetzen, zu, ähm, zu stärken und ähm, ja, vielleicht auch dann auszubauen und vielleicht bekommt man dann auch ein zivilgesellschaftliches Forum, wie wir das bei der östlichen Partnerschaft haben, hin. Ich glaube, das wäre ein guter Beginn und würde vor allen Dingen die Zivilgesellschaft in diesen Ländern, die teilweise sehr schwach ist und unter Druck steht, doch erheblich stärken. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. von Kramon. Anybody wish to speak against uh, this amendment? No, so we ask the rapporteur his opinion. Mr. Chairman, I uh, think that this is a very concrete and uh, useful um, idea to involve uh, the civil society uh, in our work. And I think both the parliamentary side and also the governmental side. So my fully support for this amendment. Thank you very much. So we vote on amendment number 38. Those in favor, raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Abstentions? Thank you very much. So amendment number 38 is adopted. So with this, uh, we conclude the discussion of the amendments. Thank you very much. And now I propose to formally vote on the draft resolution as amended. Those in favor of adopting the draft resolution, please raise your voting cards. 
Take pictures, take pictures. <laughs> Thank you very much. Those against? Two against. Abstentions? One, two, abs two abstentions. So the draft resolution tabled by our rapporteur, Mr. Choskun Chorus, is adopted. Congratulations for your work. Sure. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank all my colleagues. Uh, some of you know that I am not running um, in the upcoming elections in the Netherlands, so um, I stopped being a rapporteur. It was uh, a good, sometimes a hot discussions, and we should to the, uh, dare to discuss as politicians in the committee, in the plenary. I enjoyed that, and I wish the person who follows me, my job as a rapporteur, a big, a big success, and I, I'm, I'm believing that he or she will succeed in the same way as I did, and I thank you again. We thank you very much, uh, Mr. Charles. Uh, I be, believe uh, we have known you in your work in the, in the Assembly, and we know for sure that uh, uh, you, know, you had already a remarkable career in politics in the Netherlands and the international institutions, so we look forward to finding ways to cooperate in the future uh, with you. And for sure, um, the fact that you're not running is not only a loss uh, for the uh, Parliament of the Netherlands, but certainly also for the Assembly. So we regret that, but we wish you the best in the proceeding of your career. Thank you very much for your work uh, with, the, with this committee and with the Assembly over these years. So we now move uh, uh, on the next supplementary items, which are remaining. There are two of them. The first one is addressing racism and xenophobia affecting people of African descent in the OSE region, uh, which has been sponsored by our colleague and friend, also from the Netherlands, uh, Kathleen Ferrier, and now I give you the floor, Kathleen, to uh, present the resolution to the committee. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, just like last year, my colleague from the United States Congress, Mr. Elsie Hastings and I have worked together on a supplementary item that addresses racism and xenophobia in the OSCE region. Mr. Hastings cannot be with us today, but I would like to stress that this resolution is also very much his text, and I thank him and Mrs. Misha Thompson from the U.S. Helsinki Commission for the fruitful cooperation in the preparation of this document. As a result of both voluntary and forced migration, the OSCE region is home to more than 42 million people of African descent. The OSCE has before recognized the special contribution these people have made to our history and culture. You will remember that last year our assembly unanimously adopted a resolution which called for the OSCE to recognize 2011 as the UN International Year for People of African Descent and in November 2011, ODIR held a round table on contemporary forms of racism against people of African ancestry. Mr. Hastings and I believe that the fight against racism and xenophobia remains at the core of the OSCE comprehensive concept of security. Discrimination threatens the security of individuals and social cohesion and this has the potential to lead to wider conflict and violence in our countries. As a special representative on migration, I have seen the viciousness of racial hatred while visiting the African center in Kiev, Ukraine, in February of this year. I have spoken with representatives of the African community there and heard horrifying stories of violence and bigotry. 
it's not my intention to single out Ukraine here as a special case. We should be aware that these things happen in all of our countries. We as parliamentarians need to set the example in the fight against racism and facilitate racial and ethnic minority participation at all levels of our national, regional and local governments. We need to strengthen the capacity of our legal institutions to address racial discrimination. That is, among other things, what this resolution calls for. I strongly urge you to support it. Mr. Chairman, I hope you will me allow me a short word of farewell, because this will be the last event of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly that I will attend. In September, we have parliamentary elections in the Netherlands, and I have decided not to run for re-election. So I will also wrap up my work as a special representative on migration. Since I'm very much aware that I could not have done this work without the collaboration of you all, but specifically without the collaboration of the assistance of our Dutch delegation, Frederike van der Hengst and Arjen Westerhof, I want to start by thanking them. Specifically, I want to wholeheartedly thank Arjen Westerhof for his permanent interest in the subject and his valuable assistance. Mr. Chair, it has been an honor to serve as special representative on migration since October 2009, um, this uh, um, organization. I have tried to connect the people in the OSCE who work on migration issues, let them know about each other's work and let them learn from their best practices. I have seen how important it is to work constantly on the collection of objective data, and I still believe an OSCE network of focal points would be the best way to structure data and contacts and to permanently safeguard the benefits of bringing this expertise together. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude with a call on the Permanent Council to make the means available for such a network. I wish you all the best in the work of this assembly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, after these two announcements from the Dutch delegation, I think we have to send a diplomatic protest <laughs> <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to the authorities of the Netherlands because, I mean, uh, uh, the work you have done as a special representative in this committee over this year, I think has been a refreshing one, always ready to stand up uh, to defend the rights of the vulnerable people. And uh, we know that uh, to do this is not uh, often, in many countries, a popular thing to be done with, uh, with the electors. So we thank you for this, also for uh, choosing not to run in this occasion, maybe because there were not the conditions, because it's, we know it's not an easy task to, to bring forward this work, and you have been an example in, uh, in doing this, so I hope that this committee and the assembly will be able to, to continue you, the work you have done on this issue uh, over the years. So thank you again, and the best of luck with the continuation of your career, but for, before uh, doing the fire, we move on to debate your supplementary item, and now we open the debate on this, and I have uh, uh, three members who have uh, signed up to speak on the debate. I will close the list of speakers at the end of the first, uh, which is Ms. Heidi Fry from uh, Canada, and then we move to the consideration of the amendments and to vote on the supplementary item. Ms. Fry, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And before I begin to speak to this particular item, I, I want to say, uh, I'll echo your words that indeed uh, Ms. Ferrier has been an extraordinary colleague to work with, as many of the issues of gender and, as you see, minority status have overlapped. Um, she has been a source of great uh, information and actually huge passion. Uh, you can always hear about Kathleen that she is passionate about what she does and puts everything into it. So I, for one, would be very sorry to see her go. Um, I, I wanted to support this re re resolution and uh, because I think 
yes, as I spoke about gender, I wanted, I, I talked about the fact that you had to look at four groups within gender, and one of them were racial groups, and they were groups that we consider to be visible minorities in that you can see their differences. They are either different because of the color of their skin, because of particular characteristics and features, and of course, people of African descent um, have also not only visible minorities, but they have a history um, that has created much of the discrimination and stereotyping. They came to Europe and in fact to the New World in Canada and the United States uh, as slaves. And while Canada does not have a strong history of slavery, that stereotyping of the inferior race has remained with people of African descent. And I think that, that, that what Mr. Hastings did when he brought this forward is to ask us to remember that we have to move on and recognize the contributions that many people of African descent bring and of the respect that we must have for people of African descent in that they have a great deal to contribute, not only to the e economy, to the social uh, growth of a country and to, the, and to the cultural growth of a country, but to, to, to the real competitiveness of a country and the way that that country can become a new global nation. Because we consider that, that Africa indeed is, uh, is part of the world and that as we work with Africa, that ability to understand global realities will be very helpful if we recognize and respect people of African descent. So thank you very much and I want to support this resolution. Thank you very much, Ms. Fry. We uh, now close the list of speakers on this debate and we move with Mr. Alderhor for the United States Congress. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I arise to speak uh, in support uh, of this resolution this morning uh, on the uh, people of African descent in the OSC region that uh, was brought up by uh, uh, the Member of Parliament, uh, Ferrier, and uh, we appreciate uh, her uh, support uh, in this. Uh, of course, as she mentioned, it was co-drafted by uh, my colleague from the House of Representatives and former uh, Assembly President, uh, Alcee Hastings, uh, who, as was mentioned, is not here with us today. But for the last decade, this uh, OSC Parliamentary Assembly has been a leader in the fight against intolerance uh, and discrimination in the OSC region, uh, beginning with the adoption of the 2002 resolution on combating anti-Semitism to subsequent resolutions calling for efforts to address discrimination against Roma, Muslims, Christians, migrants, and others. Today's resolution continues the OSC Parliamentary Assembly tradition by bringing awareness to the situation of vulnerable people in the region and calling for action. During last year's 2011 International Year for People of African Descent, the OSC held the first ever roundtable on the contemporary uh, forms of racism and xenophobia affecting peoples of African descent in the OSC region. Uh, findings from the roundtable concluded that close to 50 million people of African descent live in the OSC region experience various amounts of inequality and discrimination, including in education, housing, and employment sectors. The recent death in the United States of African-American youth uh, Trayvon Martin and uh, the decade-long effort to bring the murders of black British youth, Stephen Lawrence to justice, highlights the ongoing issues of the American, uh, of the African descent and uh, how this needs to be addressed in an equitable manner. Uh, this resolution simply calls for the participating states to address these issues by implementing existing commitments to combat racism, xenophobia, and hate crimes and recommendations from the OSC's Roundtable on Contemporary Forms of Racism and Xenophobia Affecting Peoples of African Descent in the OSC Region. Again, I want to thank uh, Ms. Uh, Sferrier uh, for her uh, help with this uh, amendment uh, and also the help from the, uh, the support from the Rapporteur uh, for their work on this as well. So I would add, urge my uh, colleagues to support uh, uh, this uh, uh, amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alderhort. I now call on Claudio D'Amico, della Delegazione Italiana, and then uh, Lord Dubs from the UK. Grazie, Presidente. Innanzitutto voglio eh, ringraziare eh, l'Onorevole Ferrier perché in questi anni eh, si è, ha lavorato molto e bisogna ammetterlo. E, devo dire che molto spesso 
le nostre idee sono state divergenti, però c'è sempre stato il massimo rispetto e questo è il bello della nostra organizzazione, della democrazia, dove ci si può confrontare nel massimo rispetto per le idee, perché è corretto che ci siano idee diverse, se no ci sarebbe l'omologazione eh, che noi sappiamo che c'è stata magari in certi periodi di dittature. La, viviamo in un tempo dove la democrazia, per fortuna in molte parti del mondo, si è eh, diffusa, eh, non dappertutto, dobbiamo lavorare per questo, però eh, la ringrazio perché il confronto c'è sempre stato, ma eh, nei termini corretti della normale dialettica politica, eh, senza eh, altri tipi di, 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 mh, eh, di problemi, di atteggiamenti. Ecco. In questo caso devo dire su questa risoluzione che eh, assolutamente io sono favorevole a fare qualcosa contro il razzismo e la xenofobia, su questo non c'è nessun dubbio. Eh, devo dire anche che in Italia noi abbiamo avuto, per chi ha seguito un fatto eh, di, di cronaca sportiva degli ultimi, degli ultimi giorni e chi ha seguito il campionato europeo avrà visto che l'Italia ha avuto il suo attaccante migliore che è una persona di origine africana, eh, è una persona che fu adottata da, da bambino, da piccolo bambino, è cresciuto con un nome italiano, è, è cresciuto con una cultura eh, legata all'Italia, è diventato l'attaccante migliore dell'Italia. E su questo penso che nessuno in Italia abbia nessun problema eh, perché il colore della pelle è diverso o perché è, nasce da, da una famiglia africana. Però dobbiamo anche considerare che eh, possono esserci dei fenomeni eh, negativi. Ci possono essere fenomeni negativi in tutti i sensi. Io credo che questa risoluzione qui, che vado poi a toccare meglio la risoluzione e esprimere il perché alla fine la mia, eh, il mio parere non è del tutto favorevole a questa risoluzione, perché secondo me questa risoluzione contiene in alcuni passaggi eh, delle semplificazioni che possono cadere in tranello, perché eh, qui si sta seguendo un percorso, sono, è stato detto, sono state portate avanti diverse risoluzioni negli anni a favore di un gruppo sociale, dei Rom, eh, degli immigrati più in generale, adesso delle persone di origine africana e mi sembra che continuare a sottolineare singoli gruppi eh, originari di determinati paesi serva a aumentare ancora di più quella parte di divisione, di ghettizzazione che sta avvenendo. Perché eh, uno dei problemi che nascono in Europa è proprio quello della ghettizzazione e della non integrazione di persone che vengono da fuori. Io ho portato l'esempio di, di quel calciatore perché è perfettamente integrato. Ci sono invece gruppi di persone che non si integrano e continuare a considerarli come un gruppo a parte Secondo me è pericoloso, perché fa nascere in loro una consapevolezza di essere diversi, cosa che non deve essere così, perché quando sei ammesso, quando sei inserito con i documenti, eccetera, devi avere eh, la possibilità di essere considerato come tutti gli altri. E poi continuamente fare risoluzioni solo per un gruppo sociale è discriminante per gli altri, perché noi abbiamo una grande immigrazione anche asiatica. E su questo però non si è mai detto niente, perché gli asiatici non devono essere considerati come gli altri. E non solo... Noi abbiamo anche una grossa, eh, a volte, problematica relativamente alle persone endemiche, le culture e le civiltà che eh, hanno occupato l'Europa da migliaia di anni e che si trovano ad avere problemi. Ecco, sui cittadini che risiedono e che risiedevano in Europa prima dell'arrivo del, degli immigrati non si parla mai e di problemi ce ne sono. Anche qua sembra che l'intolleranza nasca perché noi dobbiamo andare anche a capire i problemi. Perché nasce l'intolleranza? L'intolleranza non nasce perché, a volte perché ci sono dei matti, è vero, ma l'intolleranza a volte nasce anche da incomprensioni, da incomprensioni nel differente modo di vivere e di cultura. Eh, sono capitati tanti casi in Italia di persone di origine africana che con dei determinati comportamenti, come quello di, eh, faccio esempi concreti perché alla fine sono queste le cose che fanno nascere poi i problemi, con la macellazione di un animale con un rito islamico sul balcone di una casa, davano fastidio a tutto il palazzo, è nata intolleranza nei loro confronti, ma probabilmente se loro avessero capito che in Italia quelle cose non si fanno, forse meglio andare alla macelleria, ok, e poi concludo, mi permette una questione importante per esprimere, bene, per esprimere bene il concetto. Forse
forse non sarebbe nata una reazione, che è sbagliata, lo ammetto, però dovevamo considerare anche il fatto che chi arriva con culture diverse in un paese dove una cultura di base c'è, deve cercare di integrarsi e non cercare di sovvertire la cultura locale, perché questo può far nascere intolleranze che sono sbagliate e di questo non c'è traccia in questa risoluzione, non solo, si parla di dare i diritti politici. Allora, ecco, su questo io voglio essere chiaro, i diritti politici ce li hanno le persone che secondo la legge di ogni Stato li possono avere e quindi chi diventa in Italia, chi è cittadino italiano, che sia di un colore della pelle o di un altro, ha il diritto politico di votare e di essere eletto, ma lo decide il singolo Stato. Non è che noi diciamo tutti quelli che arrivano perché sono stranieri devono avere, o perché vengono dalla, da, da, di discendenza africana devono avere i diritti politici. I diritti politici è ogni singolo Stato che lo decide. E quindi bisogna lasciare la possibilità a ogni singolo Stato di continuare su questa linea. Dai. Per questo ci sono alcuni elementi di questa risoluzione assolutamente condivisibili e al quale sono favorevoli, altri invece no. E per questo eh, dichiaro di non essere d'accordo all'approvazione di questa risoluzione. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now call on Mr. Dubs. Uh, let's try to maintain our statements uh, in a uh, few minutes. We, had, uh, we didn't set uh, a limit so I couldn't interrupt uh, this colleague, but let's try to remain in three, four minutes at the most. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Chair. I shall speak as if you had, if you had set a limit. I really just want to ask one question, and it's this that part of this resolution talks about people of African origin, part of it talks about dealing with racism and xenophobia for all people who might suffer. And certainly from the UK point of view, one of our largest minorities comes from the Asian, sub uh, Asian Indian subcontinent. And those people would probably suffer from discrimination as much as people in Britain of African origin. So I just wonder why, why the resolution is limited in this way, particularly as, for example, in, in paragraph 14, where it talks about education and textbooks and history and so on, that would apply equally to people of, um, uh, of, Asian, of Asian origin living in Europe as people of Africans. So I just wonder why we're limiting the resolution. Otherwise, it's fine. Thank you, uh, Lord Dabbs. So the debate uh, on this issue is um, now closed. Uh, well, no, it's not closed until Ms. Ferrier, uh, if she's willing to respond to the speakers, and then we move on the amendments. You have the floor, madam. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank all the colleagues for their valuable contributions to this important debate and the kind words they have spoken. I am very grateful to Heidi Fry and Mr. Aderhold for uh, stressing the importance of a special focus on people of African descent. And uh, I can immediately uh, answer our colleague from the uh, United Kingdom saying um, we have focused on people from African descent since we are still looking back at last year, 2011, what, which was the International Year of People of African Descent. But uh, Mr. Hastings and I specifically wanted to uh, give this also a broader view because I'm very much aware that it's not only people of African descent that suffer from discrimination and xenophobia. Well recognized the people from the subcontinent in our own country, uh, the Netherlands, people from the Antilles, from Suriname. So please read this resolution as parting from people from African descent, but with the intention to have a broader view. Um, it's, um, it's very good to hear also that this resolution, uh, supplementary item, stands in a long tradition of this assembly on fighting uh, intolerance, like we had also resolutions on anti-Semitism. And to hear you all stressing the importance of the contribution of people from outside Europe, let me put it that way, from outside Europe, their contribution on culture and history. And uh, since the last uh, European Cup football, I would also add sports. When we think of Mr. Balotelli playing a very important uh, role in the, Italian, uh, in the Italian team. It's um, always good to hear my colleague from Italy, D'Amico, say how important it is to have this forum as a place where we can differ 
in our opinions. And because I also think that places like this should be a place where we can all speak frankly and we can disagree on certain points, but finally see what is the principal issue that I want to bring forward together with Mr. Hastings and I in my uh, task as special representative on migration is that we as politicians should see how we can change our laws and our institutions in such a way that people can participate and be seen as who they really are and have the chance to develop their talents. That is what I'm aiming at. That is what Mr. Hastings and I were aiming at when we worked on this resolution. And I thank you all for bringing forward the specific points and please see it as starting from people of African descent, but with a broader view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ferrier. Uh, with that, we conclude the debate on the draft resolution and we move uh, uh, on the men to the amendments uh, to the resolution. We have one amendment uh, which has been tabled. And uh, as I said, I will allow one speaker in favor and one against. And then I'll proceed to ask uh, the opinion of the main sponsor of the resolution. Uh, we have uh, amendment number one tabled by Mr. Rashkin from the Russian Federation. You have the floor, sir. Hmm? Yes. Amendment. Yes, we are uh, going to discuss uh, your amendment, number one, to the draft resolution of Ms. Ferrier, the draft resolution on uh, addressing racism and xenophobia affecting people of African descent in the OSC region. If you wish to present the amendment, if not, we just move uh, to vote on it. It's not mandatory. All right, you have the floor. Mm -hmm. Коллеги, по поправке 1 после пункта 2 предлагается добавить новый пункт, именно принимая во внимание Дюрбанскую декларацию, программу действий и итоговый документ конференции по обзору Дюрбанского процесса, а также резолюции Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН 6643 о недопустимости определенных видов практики, которые способствуют эскалации современных форм расизма, расовой дискриминации, ксенофобии и связанной с ней нетерпимости. Мы бы считали, что это не только дополнит, но и улучшит э, пункт 2 э, резолюции. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Anybody wish uh, to speak against uh, this amendment? If not, we ask Ms. Ferrier her opinion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm against this amendment for the simple reason that, according to my opinion, it broadens too much the focus of this uh, supplementary item. If there's one thing I've learned in the years that I've been working as special representative on migration, it is the importance of focusing. And I would say that by now adding the Durban Declaration and the program of action, as well as the UN resolution 66143, that would broaden uh, the scope too much. I want to focus on the OSCE region, since I have learned that that is the best way to come to uh, concrete steps, which we need so badly, and therefore I'm against this resolution, this amendment. Thank you very much, Ms. Ferrier. We now move to vote on, on amendment number one. Uh, those in favor, please uh, raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Abstentions? None. So the amendment number one is rejected. So we now move uh, uh, to vote uh, on the, the draft uh, uh, resolution, which has not been amended. So those in favor of the resolution, please raise your cards. Thank you. 
Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Abstentions? So the draft resolution sponsored by Ms. Ferrier is adopted with uh, two uh, vote against it. Thank you very much. And congratulations and the best of luck again for your work. Uh, we now move to the next uh, uh, supplementary item on the agenda, which has been uh, sponsored by uh, Congressman Smith uh, from the United States. Uh, the supplementary item is uh, about protecting vulnerable populations from human trafficking. And Mr. Smith, I understand, is not uh, present uh, today here with us, so I call on Mr. Georgiev from uh, Macedonia to speak on this issue. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear fellow delegates, uh, at each annual session, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly has been faithful to turn its attention towards a pressing need in the fight against human trafficking. The supplementary item before the Assembly today, protecting vulnerable populations from human trafficking, calls on participating and partner states to focus their victim response, both prevention and identification on vulnerable populations most likely to become trafficking victims. As many participating states are beginning to recognize, the Roma community is particularly vulnerable to human trafficking. Last year, the European Roma Rights Center released a report documenting the high proportion of Roma who became uh, trafficking victims. Despite the fact that Roma are a minority of the population, Roma represented between 40 and 80, I repeat, between 40 and 80 percent of the human trafficking victims in the every country surveyed for the report. The reasons for vulnerability were varied. Structural forms of ethnic and gender discrimination, poverty and social exclusion, low educational achievements, high level of unemployment, usury, growing up in state care, domestic violence, and substance abuse. However, the result was the same, extreme vulnerability leading to human trafficking on a shocking scale. The report showed that poor relations with law enforcement also prevented victim identification, which is necessary in most countries for victims to receive very needed rehabilitative services. Tragically, trafficking victims who do not receive services have an even higher vulnerability of, to being trafficked a second time. In order to fight this disturbing trend, the supplementary item before us today calls on the participating states to establish in major cities special Roma-oriented task forces composed of Romani NGO, Romani mediators, and Romani community representatives, along with members of state law enforcement, anti-trafficking authorities, and social services representatives. Such task forces can increase trust, communication, and teamwork in order to prevent the trafficking of Roma, bringing traffickers to justice and rehabilitate the victims. Mr. Chris Smith, who authored this supplementary item, has seen success with his uh, 40 similar task forces in major cities across the United States. This supplementary item also notes that the overall victim identification in the OSC region has declined in recent years, although we have no reason to believe that the victimization has declined. On the contrary, the recent economic downturn has increased the vulnerability all over the world. Desperate people are more willing to be put in danger, and traffickers are more than willing to exploit desperation. This year, uh, pardon, the year 2009 marked the high point for victim identification when, according to the Trafficking in Persons report put by the U.S. Department of State, more than 49,000 victims were identified in the OSC region. That number fell dramatically in 2010 to about 33,000, but rose again last year to 42,000. The region is moving now in the right direction towards prioritizing victim identif identification, but identification rates are far below. In response, this supplementary item calls on participating and partner states to specially train law enforcement, including Border Patrol, to focus on the individuals from vulnerable groups and to screen them with extra care for signs that they have or are li likely to become victims of human trafficking. 
This supplementary item also calls on participating and partner states to ensure that immigrants coming to work in the region are equipped to know who to call should their employees turn out to be traffickers. Uh, all participating and partner states should have a trafficking hotline and pamphlets with information on human trafficking that can be distributed with work visas made available in consular offices and anywhere else that vulnerable populations would be able to access the information. The NGOs can be excellent partners in ensuring the information gets to those who most need it. At the end, the vulnerable are the least able to help themselves which is, it is very important for us as rep representatives of the people to do everything we can to ensure limited government resources are strategically targeted at preventing the vulnerable from becoming or remaining victims. Thank you very much if you decide to support this supplementary item. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Georgiev. Uh, we now open the debate. Um, we have already seven speakers in this debate uh, and as you know we have a uh, uh, little less than 40 minutes then we have three amendments and we have two votes so i would kindly ask all the colleagues to to try to be uh, uh, below three minutes in their speech because unless we do that we might not be able to uh, to allow everybody to speak on this issue so i'll start with the uh, Ms. Bartos from the, the head of the Polish delegation, and then at the end of her speech, we will close the list of speakers. You have the floor, Madam. Dear colleagues, we meet today to discuss again how to increase our efforts to end the misery of humiliating and degrading crime the human trafficking is. Traffickers deprive their victims on, of fundamental human rights, freedom of movement, choice, control of body and might, the decision-making. The UN Crime Fighting Office announced that almost two and uh, a half million people across the globe are victims of hum human trafficking at any one time, and 32 billion US dollars is being earned every year by criminals running human trafficking networks. Extreme poverty, natural or political crisis, uncertain economic conditions, the global economic crisis, and further pressure and of food prices make children and women particularly vulnerable. It must be underlined that two out of every three victims are women who are particularly exposed to danger from criminals promising a good job or educational opportunities and then forced, uh, forcing their victims to prostitution. It is extremely profitable for members of organized crime and appears to be a crime of low risk. Criminals are getting rich while girls and women are raped and tortured physically and mentally. Mr. Chair, dear colleagues, a lot must be done to prevent and reduce the scale of trafficking in human beings. We are obliged to constant, constantly search and implement coordinated and meaningful responses to human trafficking, facing the fact that due to the complex nature of this crime and its close connections with other international issues, no country is capable of combating this threat on its own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bartos. I call on Ms. Heidi Fry to speak on this issue, and the list of speakers is now closed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I want to again congratulate Mr. Smith, who has been really consistent in the way he has dealt with this issue and followed through with it at every particular meeting I've been at. I think he makes an important point that I want to highlight, and that is that things will worsen with regard to human trafficking, because human trafficking is about exploitation. It's about exploiting people because of their poverty, because they have no economic rights. It's also about exploiting those who have a tendency to uh, 
thank you, who, who are women and who are therefore vulnerable and have no protections and therefore moving them around. I think we always think of trafficking as being sexual trafficking. I think there is trafficking for labor market as well. And so we, we look at trafficking as, part, as actually affecting men and women, but women and children are the most vulnerable in terms of trafficking. What I think that is important here is that Mr. Smith is asking for us to do some very concrete things with regard to victims. And before I, I, I support this, I want to say that I would like to point out that in Canada we see a difference between trafficking and smuggling. Smuggling is when people willingly want to come to another place, mostly for economic reasons or for escaping different forms of persecution, and they have the money to pay someone to take them across a border. When they get there, they're actually no longer in contact with this person and they're on their own. So there is a distinction. Both, of course, are exploitative and smuggling can become even worse. But the thing about trafficking, I think, that Mr. Smith wants to point out is that if we are going to help the victims, we have to be able to identify them and that there isn't a lot of, of data on, on identifying victims. There are no national or international victim ID data that we can point to. And if we cannot identify the victims, they become lost within, within the communities and the population when they arrive and continue to be victimized. I think he also talks a lot about the fact that if what we do with trafficking victims is send them back, we know that they will just be re-trafficked into another place. So he's speaking about identifying the victims, one, and two, creating legal, co legal constructs in which to help these victims to have protection of law, and two, to create programs and policies within which victims can actually be able to be rehabilitated into the populations into which they've been trafficked. So I, I support this resolution very much, but I also want us not to forget that in, in Canada, we've recognized that trafficking for us are mostly Asians and people who've come from the former Soviet Union. But we, we also need to remember that there is internal trafficking within a country as large as Canada. We have a lot of indigenous and vulnerable women and children who are trafficked across provinces and who go from rural to urban areas. These are mostly trafficked into prostitution and they are actually subsumed into the addiction uh, that holds them into, into becoming sex slaves. So I think we need to be really sure that we don't just talk about this, we talk about it a lot, but that we put in place the tools and the data that we need to be able to deal with this effectively and efficiently. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fry, for your remarks, and I give the floor to Mr. Adahold from the United States. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, would like to thank uh, my good friend for uh, managing this supplementary item for the United States, and uh, especially on this issue of human trafficking. And I'd also uh, like to lend my uh, strong support uh, for this supplementary item. The United States uh, Department of State uh, released its annual trafficking in, per in persons report just a few weeks ago. Um, it is a catalog of progress and challenging facing each of our countries. Progress often means the discovery of new challenges, problems that were hidden, but that can be successfully addressed if brought into light. Such as the case is with trafficking of vulnerable populations, such as the Roma. And we can target the protection of these individuals for those who would, who aim is to exploit. I have been encouraged in recent months to see new attention in the region on obstacles faced by this particular community whose vulnerability to exploitation has only increased in the economic downturn. Over the last several years, most participating and partner states have invested in the three P's to fight human trafficking, which is protection, prosecution, and prevention. You have good laws and financial resources to fight this problem. However, the implementation is a problem because of the lack of coordination between law enforcement, victim services, and civil society. Victim, victims do not receive the help they need because they're not in, identified by the law enforcement. Or if they are identified by the law enforcement, they do not know where to send the victims for rehabilitation. The United States has itself addressed this problem in many parts of the country through convening task forces in each of the cities where there is most need. I believe this approach will be particularly useful in the Roma community, and I would strongly support uh, this supplementary item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank 
you, Mr. Alderhort. Uh, we now give the floor to Ms. Felan from the uh, Irish delegation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would very much like to um, support this uh, supplementary item and, like previous speakers, compliment um, Chris Smith on the uh, work that he has done to date. Um, I would just like to make the Assembly aware that, as part of our chairmanship, uh, this area is uh, one of our priorities and uh, to mainly look how it impacts on uh, women and children but also uh, not to forget that a number of uh, men have also been um, trafficked into um, the uh, labour market as well. But I, th I think the key to tackling trafficking is to make sure that all the participating states, that all our police forces are dealing with this um, trafficking um, that we're all singing from the one hymn sheet and that I would like to see that... Uh, the Roma population, we have to look at um, education and the empowerment of uh, Roma women. So I would very much like to support this supplementary item. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Felan. Uh, we now move to Canada and I give the floor to Ms. Turmel to speak on this issue. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Président, collègues parlementaires. Je tiens à féliciter le présenteur d'avoir inscrit ce sujet à l'ordre du jour très important. Je pense qu'il est temps qu'on en discute. À bien des écarts, la traite de personnes est l'une des violations les plus horribles des droits de la personne. C'est aussi l'une des activités criminelles les plus rentables et connaissant la plus forte croissance dans ce monde. Des mesures internationales durables nécessite des obligations juridiques internationales en la matière. J'encourage les pays qui n'ont pas encore ratifié le protocole visant à prévenir, réprimer et punir la traite des personnes, en particulier des femmes et des enfants, aussi appelé protocole de Palerbe à le faire. En tant que parlementaires, nous devons continuellement renforcer les politiques visant à prévenir l'exploitation de, de nos citoyens. Je crois qu'une mesure importante, mais nullement suffisante, pour éradiquer ce fléau mondial est la mise en œuvre efficace des mécanismes nationaux. Par exemple, le Canada a adopté il y a quelques semaines son plan d'action national de lutte contre la traite des personnes. Il concentre ses efforts sur quatre domaines prioritaires qui sont décrits dans le protocole de Palerme et qui correspondent aux pratiques exemplaires approuvées à l'échelle internationale. Par exemple, la prévention de la traite de personnes la protection de victimes, la poursuite des auteurs de ce crime, le travail en partenariat avec d'autres parties sur la scène nationale et internationale. Un groupe de travail sur la traite de personnes dirigé par Sécurité publique Canada et comptant sur la participation de ministères clés supervisera la mise en œuvre des engagements pris dans le plan d'action national et fera le point publiquement chaque année. De plus, le Canada investira annuellement plus de 6 millions de dollars dans les activités de lutte contre la traite de personnes. En août, il y a quelques jours, le Parlement du Canada a adopté un projet de loi qui a reçu l'appui unanime de tous les partis. Cette mesure législative étant le champ d'application territoriale de la loi et donne aux tribunaux canadiens compétence pour juger les crimes de traite des personnes commis à l'extérieur du Canada par des concitoyens canadiens ou des résidents permanents. Afin de refléter plus fidèlement le protocole de Palerme, la loi prévoit également que pour déterminer si un accusé exploite une autre personne et commet une infraction liée à la traite de personnes, le tribunal peut notamment prendre en compte les faits suivants. L'accusé a utilisé ou menacé d'utiliser la force ou toute autre forme de contrainte. Il a recouru à la tromperie. Il a abusé de son pouvoir ou de la confiance d'une personne. En conclusion, Combattre la traite des personnes à l'échelle nationale, bilatérale, régionale et internationale ne sera pas chose facile. Le succès à cet égard passe par des engagements accrus à l'égard de la prévention et de la sensibilisation, des approches cohérentes et intégrées en matière de normes internationales, un suivi constant des progrès, la traduction en justice des responsables et des garanties de sécurité pour les victimes. Merci, M. le Président. Thank you very much. Uh, and I now give the floor to Ms. Dade from the Albanian delegation. You have the floor, madam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I strongly support and I compliment Mr. Smith on this resolution. And 
I also might refer to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who is really so much committed in this uh, problem. And only recently I read the report from Department of State and I made it a point in the Parliament because my country is criticized for not having any visible results in four years. And I have to draw the attention to this organization that this trafficking in person cannot be considered a domestic issue, like other issues of human rights. These are issues which are at the focus of the work of this organization and especially of this committee. If we don't assist governments to tackle with these problems, then what other job have we got to do? And to assist means also to finger point. And this has nothing to do with the people. This has to do with the governments who do not uh, take care of resolving these problems, despite of the fact that strategies are in place, legislation is in place. The problem is that these are not implemented. And we have to also worry that this phenomenon has acquired new features. Now it is domestic or internal or within the region. And if you see that people from Albania might be trafficked even to Serbia or Kosovo or Ukraine or Macedonia, this is too problematic. And it, this has nothing to do only with Roma. This has to do with all kind of uh, simple people who cannot find any solution for their everyday life. That's why I strongly support this, and of course this is not a matter of rhetoric, even here in this OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, but we have to cooperate with all organizations and find the necessary instruments how to make our governments stick to the obligations when we ratify conventions, when we ratify all what we have taken as obligations vis-a-vis -vis the organizations we are a member of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Dade. And I'm now pleased to give the floor to our colleague from Serbia, Gordana Komic. You have the floor. I'm strongly supporting this resolution. I think that support to a resolution is a matter of human decency, not a political attitude of anyone. And as any, any other thing coming from and rooted in what should be human approach to other human beings, it doesn't look strong in, in real life. And often we are criticized that here in OEC or back home throughout the parliament, etc., elsewhere, we are bringing declarations, resolutions, decisions, blah, 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 blah. But in the real life, there is no true impact of that what I, again, deeply believe that is a matter of human decency and not a political attitude. But nevertheless, the, the whole idea of combating trafficking and trying to protect all of those who are victims of, of trafficking, trying to, to protect societies of being blind to, the, to the, the, the sector where a lot of uh, people are suffering as a victim of, uh, of human trafficking, I also see that if you go through day by day, it does look like nothing is changing and we do not make a true impact. But if you look back for a, a longer time scale, then you see everything is changed, totally everything. Just to look 10 years or 15 years ago, which is quite a small piece of time in, in, in scales of uh, how political decisions are implemented and do they give an impact. And the context of uh, my personal uh, struggle to, to see the, the laws, the, 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 in any decisions in, on any level of authorities in Serbia to be implemented is that we should know what actually we are fighting against. There are three main points that I find on daily basis in my struggle to see uh, resolutions like we are uh, debating uh, upon right now. Uh, that is the, the first one is among those people who who are entitled and paid by tax money uh, to implement. Uh, and they are say, well, you know, there always have been uh, prostitution. There are always been poor people or poor women or poor whoever uh, who had to 
uh, ha had to do what what is offered as 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 a trafficking area of uh, suffering life, and and it, it's hard to overcome the stereotyping, the easiness of stereotyping that uh, those who are victim of of trafficking they are used to it. It's their way of life. You don't can't do anything to really change that. The second point that it, it's hard to overcome is uh, procedures within uh, parts of the authorities who should implement. So there is a law, for example, in Serbia, there is a national plan of action, but when you go to the field, then nothing happened. Why nothing happened? Well, nobody knows how to, uh, how to uh, make life from the wordings that we adopt throughout laws, resolutions, or declarations. And the third one is uh, actually poor information campaign, poor governing by explaining to the people who are uh, actually subjects of, of, of the, those kind of, of documents to be helped. There is a level of higher authorities, middle or lower, but if you go to Roma community in my country and ask, do you know that you are protected? There, are, there is a mechanism that you don't have to do what you are forced to do due to the traditional customs or whatever in your family. There, there are mechanisms that, that you, you can be helped then she or he is looking at me with bright, lovely eyes saying, no, I don't know. Because nobody from us shared the information. And those three circles of spiral circles of, of, of vicious circles sometimes actually prevent us to show our human side of human decency supporting this uh, kind of document really implemented. That's why I... I don't have an amendment because I don't know how to amend such a resolution. It's, it's, it's a good resolution. But I have a proposal to all of us to think about idea that appeared among us that chairmanships in the future should have a common plan, not for a year, but for two years, three years, four years. And maybe um, human trafficking combat task forces should be a common plan for whoever we in, in, in office in, as a chairmanship in office in next year or, or seven years from now. Uh, because if it worked with media sector, if it worked with gender sector, it must work with, with sector that we all agree upon uh, to, to form and to be the inevitable part of the plan for the, any, anyone who, who will chair this organization in the future. I thank you principal sponsor of, of this uh, resolution, and thank you for the opportunity to address you. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Gordana. I think um, you summed it up very well, and I think you know, most of the people who spoke in this deba debate also on other issues, uh, are we are all facing this issue. How can we make sure that the words, the norms that we adopt then are followed up and implemented in, in the reality? So that, that is an open challenge, and I just want to raise the fact that uh, you mentioned the chairmanship. We know that in a couple of years, you know, Serbia will be uh, also chairman of this organization. So we have maybe uh, some time also to work towards this goal, maybe even before with the Irish and the uh, Ukrainian chairmanship to, to, to try to achieve some of these issues which are very relevant for, for us and for the uh, relevance of our organization. It is, it is very, very important. Uh, with this, uh, uh, I now ask uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Georgiev from Macedonia if he wants to reply to the debate. Um, just uh, briefly, many thanks to... You, no, you were not in the, in the list of speakers. Avevo chiesto la parola all'inizio, avevo fatto segno, l'hanno visto tutti i miei colleghi, ho visto un, un, un gesto da parte sua, avevo fatto così, ma hanno visto tutti i miei colleghi. Maybe I was saying hello, but I didn't see anything. <laughs> anyway, we can give you one minute because we don't have much time. Uh, I, non non avevo, non avevo visto, Claudio. Però un minuto, perché abbiamo, we have three amendments and then we have to close at 11. So please, try to be brief. Eh, mi scusi Presidente, però è una questione molto importante, avevo chiesto la parola, 
ho, ho i testimoni, insomma, ecco. quindi un minuto vuol dire proprio quasi non parlare, dovrò riassumere veramente in modo molto, molto drastico un concetto che invece è importante perché si tratta di una questione importante. Eh, ringrazio lo sponsor di questa risoluzione perché sicuramente il titolo non è eh, criticabile, eh, però secondo me mh, non andiamo a fondo della questione. Il punto è che noi, e io sono assolutamente, eh, sarei assolutamente duro contro il traffico di mh, esseri umani perché è una piaga che eh, 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 in, questo, in questi anni, negli ultimi anni, eh, è, eh, tocca un po' tutti i nostri paesi, ma noi dobbiamo partire da essere assolutamente duri con i trafficanti. Quindi noi dobbiamo prevedere che le, tutte le, le leggi dei nostri paesi siano eh, inasprite contro chi sfrutta per motivi economici il passaggio di persone da un paese all'altro in modo irregolare. Poi dobbiamo anche considerare, io non sono d'accordo con quello che è stato detto da, qualche, da qualche, mh, qualche altro delegato, che un conto è il contrabbando, così chiamato, di persone che pagano un biglietto e vanno, un conto è la tratta. Eh, io penso che tutto sia da considerare tratta, perché ormai è il 95% delle persone che vengono spostate pagano qualcosa a questi trafficanti, non è che vengono rapiti. Quei pochi che vengono senza la loro volontà, allora non sono vittime di tratta, sono rapiti, sono persone che sono rapite, ci sono le leggi contro i rapimenti delle persone. Ma la maggior parte sa consapevolmente di espatriare e andare in un altro paese in modo irregolare, pagando a questi trafficanti dei soldi. Allora dobbiamo considerare, e concludo, che non si può eh, dividere le due cose, noi dobbiamo essere duri e attenzione quello che dico, che se noi continuiamo a dire a chi è vittima di tratta, cioè tutte le persone che si spostano in modo irregolare, sarete accolti, regolarizzati, noi facciamo un favore ai trafficanti, perché i trafficanti dicono pagatemi un biglietto, io vi porto là, tanto poi alla fine vi sistemano. Quindi dobbiamo stare molto attenti in questo, dobbiamo essere prima nelle restituzioni duri con i trafficanti e dire che bisogna inasprire le leggi. Io ho proposto una legge in Italia che addirittura quando ci sono vittime nel traffico si dia la pena dell'ergastolo eh, e du pene durissime per i trafficanti. Quindi dobbiamo partire prima da quello e poi arrivare al, a, alle vittime. E per concludere mi sembra che ci sia sempre una troppa esposizione sulla questione dei Rom che possono essere ricompresi in generale come tutti gli altri. Quindi con queste luci ed ombre che ci sono su questa risoluzione non voterò contro perché non posso votare contro un, un protezione di persone vittime di qualcosa. Però mancano eh, dei, dei punti che ritengo fondamentali e sensibili e quindi per questo eh, mi asterrò sulla risoluzione. Grazie, Claudio D'Amico, hai parlato due minuti e trenta secondi. Eh, per la replica, brevemente, prego al nostro collega della Macedonia, Mr. Georgiev. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, briefly, many thanks to all the people, all the delegates that took uh, part in the, in the debate. Yes, they've raised the question of the woman vulnerability, uh, and especially the woman trafficking, uh, the issue of internal trafficking in, in all the countries, and many, many other things. Uh, also, the contributions that were done by the US representative from Ireland, Serbia, Albania, uh, Many thanks to, to, to everyone from Poland, from Canada, from Italy. So once again, uh, thank you for, for the support. Many, many thanks to, to Congressman Smith, who was really, who was really passionate uh, about, about uh, all, all these things. He was not able to, to come here, but uh, a big uh, compliment and thank you from our all behalf for, for his uh, work. And let's try to do something. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, we conclude the debate on the draft resolution and we move uh, to the amendments. As I said, we have three amendments. Uh, and as I said, we have to be, be very strict on the timing now. One minute to present and one minute against. And then we will ask the main sponsor to uh, give his opinion. So uh, we move with amendment number one. Uh, we have Mr. Fittis of Cyprus. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chairman. From the beginning, we would like to congratulate the principal sponsor of the Trato Resolution, Mr. Christopher Smith, and uh, 
which uh, resolution we strongly support, of course. It is a very sensitive subject, uh, although we discuss, and the three amendments are really not amendments, are additions to the resolution. And the first one is the following. Stressing that good governance is essential in efforts against the trafficking of migrants, particularly women and children, as well as against forced labor, both of which count over 12 million affected people worldwide. The rationale. We have proposed this amendment based on an estimate of the ILO, for we consider worth mentioning the alarming numbers of victims of trafficking and forced labor. According to this estimate, victims of forced labor <laughs> trafficking. But the final, uh, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, the final uh, uh, amendment is, uh, is not that I, I read. It's after uh, correspondence with Mr. Smith, we change it a little bit, and the final is this one stressing that good governance is essential in efforts to protect vulnerable people, particularly migrants from human trafficking, which according to the International Labor Organization, at only given uh, time enclaves more than 20 million people, the majority of whom are women and girls. And this is the final uh, uh, amendment we propose with uh, Mr. Smith. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Fittis. Just to... Uh, uh, you gave me only one minute. <laughs> I couldn't uh, read the whole uh, rationale. Sure. The, <laughs> the, I, I said, unfortunately, that we are running out of time. So I okay. said... Uh, but uh, what I would do... Uh, uh, you have already read the amendment. You okay. are proposing an oral amendment to the one that was proposed, and also the oral Slightly amendment has, has been uh, uh, distributed, so the colleagues uh, have, uh, have it. And uh, uh, so it is quite clear because you, you read it also in the new version. Thank you very much. So we now, uh, I ask if there are, anybody wish to speak against this amendment? If not, we ask uh, uh, Mr. Georgiev his opinion on it. Uh, acceptable, the remarks are good and they're agreed with both delegations, thank you. Thank you very much. So we move to vote amendment number one. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? None. Abstentions? One abstention. So amendment number one is adopted. And I call again on Mr. Fittis to present amendment number two. You have the floor, Thank sir. you. Um, we said uh, after paragraph five, the following, uh, being aware of persisting problems in efforts to deal with human trafficking, which pertain in Teralia, to the reliability of collected data for actual and potential victims, as well as to the reluctance of lack of resources for the identification and protection of victims and the prosecution of traffickers. The Nationale, we deem useful that uh, an explicit re reference be made of, to persisting problems in efforts to effectively address human trafficking in the level of all three pillars, that the prevention, protection, and prosecution. All the more difficult are accurate estimates regarding activities carried out in the, fall, in the, sh in the shadow, be it in all terms illegal or dis disguised under a legal cover. Moreover, while greater progress has been observed uh, by the third, uh, three pillars and the trafficking policy index of states' performance regarding prevention and prosecution, a lesser progress regarding victim pro protection, reluctance of lack of resources, to adequate address human trafficking have been re recorded uh, at all three stages. Yes. You're finished? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, we, I now ask if there are any colleagues who are going to vote against this amendment. None. Uh, the opinion of the principal sponsor, please. Uh, it's acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Fittis, for the contribution. Perfect. So we vote on amendment number two. Those in favor, please raise your cards. Those against? Abstentions? 
Thank you very much. So also amendment number two has been adopted. And I call again on Mr. Fittis to present amendment number three. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, sir. I present the final uh, amendment which was done with a consultation with Mr. Smith. And this is slightly different from the original you have in, in front of, of you. We would like this, so to ask for your approval of this paragraph, which would then read a lot of stresses the need for enhanced cooperation at the stage of prevention between law enforcement authorities and non-governmental organizations towards effective awareness, raising policies among potential victims of human trafficking in countries of origin, as well as along potential buyers of commercial sex so that all are vigilant against exploitation. This is the amendment, the addition, rather, we propose. Thank and you uh, for, for this addition, Mr. Smith agrees. Perfect. Thank you very much. Anybody wish to speak against amendment number three? Uh, no. So we ask for the opinion of the principal sponsor, Mr. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. The same thing as with the first uh, amendment, uh, it's acceptable. Uh, the part that is an oral amendment, so it's acceptable and uh, it's supported. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we now move to vote on amendment number three. Those in favor of the amendment, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? None, abstentions, one abstention. So amendment number three is also adopted. Congratulations. We now uh, move uh, uh, to the vote uh, on the draft resolution as amended. Those in favor of adopting the draft resolution, please raise your cards. Thank you. Those against? Abstentions? So the draft resolution is adopted. Congratulations to Congressman Smith and Mr. Georgiev for presenting this uh, uh, supplementary item. We now move to the last uh, point on the agenda. We have very few minutes. Uh, um, this is the time of the renewal of the, uh, of the position for the committee officers for the 22nd session of the assembly. As uh, we said over the last uh, two days, uh, a nomination was closed at 9 a.m. this morning. And the International Secretariat informs me that the following nominations have been received in the table office. For chair, Mr. Matteo Meccacci from Italy. For vice chair, Ms. Isabel Santos from Portugal. And for rapporteur, Ms. Anne Felan from Ireland. As the position of chair is not contested, I declare that the nominee for the position, in this case myself, is elected by acclamation in accordance with Rule 36, Number 5. Thank you very much. Likewise, as the position of vice chair is not contested, I declare that the nominee for that position, Ms. Santos of Portugal, elected by acclamation. Congratulations. And likewise, as the position of rapporteur is not contested, I declare that the nominee for that position, Ms. Uh, uh, Felan from Ireland, is elected by acclamation. Congratulations. So with this, uh, uh, we conclude the works of the third committee for this session. I want to thank uh, really everybody for participating. Uh, we have an estimate that over 50 colleagues took the floor during the three sessions of the committee. So this highlights the high degree of uh, participation from all regions and all countries in uh, this committee. And I think this uh, uh, gave us the possibility to have uh, a, an interesting and fruitful debate on some of the issues that we believe are most important for the future of our organization. So, Thank you very much, and I declare this meeting closed.